Hey guys, let me know if you can hear me this time. Let me know. I'm doing a mic check right now and I'm hoping you guys can hear me. I don't know what was going on with my computers. With the mic on my computer, let me know if you guys can hear me. Hello guys, can you hear me? Oh, perfect. You guys can hear me. Yes. Okay. Thank God. Okay. Let me. <laughs> All righty. Because last time I was just a talking and I had no idea. I couldn't see the chat. At, I saw some of the chat, but I did not realize you guys could not um, hear me. So let me just share this. Just once again, let me just share this in my Facebook group really quickly. If you guys are not in it, it's called the Medical Assistant Lounge. So let me go ahead and do that. All righty. Just putting that in there. Glad you guys can hear me now. I was talking so much. Oh, my goodness. All right. Okay. Where's my other phone? Hold on one second. I have a mic that I'm having to hold now. Let me um, go out of this. Hold on, guys. Go to my channel. It was like, uh, let's see, let me go out, let me. Okay, guys, good, loud and clear, perfect. Thank y'all for getting back on. I was like, oh my goodness, these people are gonna be like, nah. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So in the last video, I was steadily talking. Um, I was just tell I was just answering these questions here. So I'm just going to answer them again just pretty quickly because um since you guys couldn't since you guys can hear anything, but a lot of people wanted to know will my old video still help if you're taking a new test after January? I want you to know definitely all of the information is pretty much still the same. The only difference is that the new test is adding more content. So Everything in my old videos, which you'll kind of see some of it tonight as we go through some of these questions, a lot of it is still the same. So, yes. Will my videos help if, if you're taking a different certification other than the CCMA? Yes. If you're taking the RMA, um, CMA or other tests, yes, they're going to help because a lot of the information is the same. However, I still recommend getting the study guides for those tests because... I may not go over something that's going to be on one of those tests because the CMA and the RMA, they are, they tend to be bigger and broader tests. Okay. Now, what do you do if you fail the test? I get a lot of people that come to me and say, I failed the first time. What do I do? I always say it's common to have to take it a couple of times. So if you're one of those people, maybe you're watching now and you had to, you have to take the test again, just make sure you double down in those areas where you fail short. Okay. Um, Make sure you have the study guide and practice test, okay? Can I get a job if I'm not certified? Um, yes, you can. However, more and more places are requiring certification. They have some places that will allow you to um, work for a certain amount of time. They may say, yeah, you can um, start, but we'll need you to get certified within 90 days or 60 days or maybe even 30 days. So yes, but um, more and more places now are not only... Um, uh, accepting the um, certificate, you have to actually be certified. When I say certificate, I mean your certificate of completion, your diploma. Some places that's not good enough, they want that certification. Um, can I give some study tips? And that is exa exactly what this slide is. And I just was telling you guys in the last video, <laughs> which you couldn't hear, to screenshot this, okay? Screenshot this. I do have some videos with some tips. I get this question pretty much almost every day, whether it's in my inbox on Facebook or YouTube or whatever, my email. Screenshot this. Check out those other videos that I have um, on the channel um, uh, um, when it comes to uh, studying tips because I'm always adding more. OK, so you can go ahead and screenshot this. And let me just double check the chat. I don't want to be talking then my sound goes out again. Um, somebody says, is the new test going to be harder? Um, no, not necessarily. It's just adding more information. And, um, if you guys have any questions, I'm going to answer them at the end. 
one of the uh, pieces of feedback that I got from doing these videos is that when people are watching a replay, it's very distracting when I'm stopping. And because uh, a lot of times I'll engage with you guys in the comments and stuff like that, which I'll still do here and there. But I will try not to answer any questions until the end. So that way, anybody that's watching a the replay, they can just get through the study portion. And then if they don't want to stay around at the end for the Q&A, they don't have to. All right. So gave you guys a couple seconds to screenshot this. So if this is your first time doing a study session with me, welcome. The way it works is that I'm going to show the questions. I'll give you guys a few seconds to answer in the comments, and then I'll show you guys the right answer. If you're commenting and you're getting incorrect answers, it is OK. This is what this study session is for. Don't be shy. It is OK. This is exactly why I do these. OK. Now, as you can see, uh, one of my uh, tips is to pay attention to the wrong answers, because guess what? Those wrong answers are going to end up being in questions on the test as well. So if you're going through these questions and you notice those wrong answers, you don't know what those things mean. You want to make sure you add that to your notes as well. And you should always have a pen and paper out when you're going through your study guide and practice test anyway, even during this live. Right. Have your pen and paper out. Alrighty, so which angle should you insert the needle when performing a routine venipuncture? I'll give you guys a few seconds. You're going to insert it at 90 degrees, 45 degrees, 15 degrees, or 30. Oh, man, you said it seems blurry. Is it blur? Okay, she said it is. She can see it now. And I was about to say, and I was praying I wouldn't have any issues. I had um, internet issues earlier, and so I was hoping that I'm just hoping we can get through these questions with no problem. Okay, so I'm seeing the answers coming in now. All right, so I'm going to go to. All right, so if you said 15 degrees, you're correct. So when you're doing venipuncture, it is 15 degrees, right? 90 degrees when we're going intramuscular, that's 90 degrees, right? Um, 45 degrees is subcutaneous now. The exception to that 45 degree subcutaneous is when you're doing um, an insulin injection. Insulin can be 90, even though it's a um, 45 degree angle. But that uh, vena puncture. And one thing I want to say, too, sometimes these questions are try to trick you and put in routine vena puncture and to make you think, OK, well, wait a minute. You got vena puncture and then you got routine vena puncture. That just means they're just getting a routine blood stick. Maybe they're there for a physical. Right. And they're just getting routine blood work done. Don't let them, you know, try to trick you. Some questions will do that. As we see other examples of that, I'll point it out. But vena puncture is vena puncture. The angle is always the same, okay? All right, so which of the following requires the lot number of a vaccine to be documented in a patient's medical record? Is it a National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1988, the Clinical Laboratory Amendments of 1988, Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, or the Health Insurance Portability, Portability and Accountability Act of 1996. Yeah. Uh, um, congratulations, Kier. This uh, requires a lot number of a vaccine to be documented in a patient's medical record. Give you guys a few seconds to look at that. Now, like I said, don't be shy. It's OK if you get the answer incorrect. It's OK. Don't let that keep you from, you know, participating and answering um, because this is exactly what this is for. All right, let's see. Um, she said, what's a routine vena puncture? So that's just routine blood work. So if a patient has routine vena puncture, just means that they're getting routine blood work. That's all. All righty. So if you put A, you are correct. The National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act of 1988. Now, this is one of those questions that it was just kind of right there in front of you, the lot number of a vaccine. Right. That's the child national. child. Well, I guess I can see how you probably wouldn't think because it says childhood and it just says a vaccine. But yes, that that started requiring us to put the lot number of the vaccine uh, when we're docu when we're um, documenting the patient's um, um, vaccine that we've administered. Now, Clea, 
clinical laboratory amendments of 1988. That's the laboratory regulations, right? Uh, and one of my students I see is on here. We just recently talked about that, the clear way testing. Um, occupation safety, uh, uh, occupation, I'm sorry, guys. I'm trying to get through this quickly because I don't want to have any internet issues. Um, Occupational Safety and Health Act, OSHA, and then you got HIPAA of 1996. So again, familiarize yourself with the wrong answer. So if you know that these are things you never heard of, like maybe you never heard of that Vaccine Injury Act. This is an example of something that was added to the new test, okay? So if you're taking this test prior to January, this question may not be on there. After January, this is um, one of the questions that they have added, okay? So like I said, a lot of it is the same, but some information has been added. All right. Who has the right to release patient information? The provider, the insurance company, the patient, or the patient's lawyer? Who has the right to release patient information? All right, I see all the answers coming in. Yep, the patient. Now, if the patient authorizes any of those above to um, release information, they can, but they don't have the right to release it unless the patient gives them authorization, right? All right, which of the following STI, sexually transmitted infection, is a viral infection? Trichomoniasis, pubic lice, gonorrhea, or herpes simplex? Which of the following is a viral infection? Okay, I see the answers coming in here. Oh, I see another one of my students on here. Okay, hey, Donnie. Oh, it, this is Donnie. I'm not even sure. Is that you, Donnie? All right, let's see. Yes, if you chose herpes simplex, you are correct. So again, these wrong answers, you got to know. Trichomoniasis and pubic lice, those are uh, parasitic infections. So your question might ask about that. Which of the following is a parasitic infection, right? Pubic lice, the other name for pubic lice, you got to know. Um, you've probably already seen it if you're taking any, if you've taken any of the um, practice tests, the other name, the um, the name for that is um, pediculosis. So it may not say pubic lice, it may just say pediculosis. So you got to know that gonorrhea is a bacterial infection, Okay. So trichomoniasis and pubic lice, those are parasitic infections. Gonorrhea is bacteria. Herpes is viral, okay? All right, which of the following EKG artifacts is caused by patient movement or a poorly attached electrode and results in a gradual shift of the tracing away from the center of the paper? Which of the following artifacts? Is it the interrupted baseline, the wandering baseline, AC interference or the somatic tremor. Now, some questions, um, they will actually show the artifacts. So make sure, um, you know, again, if, as you're going through this and you're realizing you don't know this, add this to your notes for, uh, um, add it to your notes, of course, write it down, but also make sure you go to that area on the study guide because the question you might see may actually have a picture of the artifact, okay? And you may have to identify the artifact. So if you know this is an area that you, you know, you struggle with, make sure you go to that area in your study guide and be able to recognize it just in case you see a picture of an EKG and it asks you which which artifact this is, because it'll ask you that. And it may even ask you, you know, um, what kind of um, arrhythmia is going on. Right. You got to be able to recognize like um, atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, bradycardia, tachycardia. So. Um, again, this is why I do these study sessions so you know exactly what you need to be studying. All right, so let me go back to my screen, see what you guys, okay, I'm seeing some mix of answers, okay. 
All right, I see you guys. All right, let's see what the answer is. All right, so if you chose wandering baseline, that is correct. So the wandering baseline is due to a poorly attached electrode, okay, or patient movement, all right? Um, and it results, the, the tracing will be going from the center of the paper, okay? Now, with the um, interrupted baseline, that's caused by an electrical um, disconnection, okay? Um, by uh, um, an electrical disconnection or detached, uh, I'm sorry, detached electrode, okay? That's a detached electrode. And that tracing you'll see moving into the margins of the paper. AC interference is an electrical interference, okay? And with those, you'll see like um, spikes in the tracing, okay? Um, and then the somatic tremor, that's usually for muscle movement. And those would be like um, peaks, like you'll see like jagged peaks in the, in the, um, in the, on the paper. So again, make sure you guys look at that on your study guide. So if you happen to see a picture, you'll know how it looks, okay? All righty. Um, so which of the following can contribute to an erroneous pulse rate? Movement, hydration, blood pressure, or weight? And then I got to uh, pull something up on in another window really quickly. So hold on one second, guys. I'm going to give you guys extra seconds for this one because I just realized I had to start this. Um, Because I had to start this live over, I need to go back to my um, thing, my settings really quickly. Hold on one second. All right, where is it? Let me go. Okay. All right, I'm back. Okay, let's see what you guys got. Okay, so I'm seeing a mix of answers. Let's see. Yep, so it's going to be movement. They can contribute to erroneous posts, right? Now, my students know because I'm always having them to not move once they've checked each other's um, vitals. So, yeah, movement. Um, hydration, blood pressure, weight, they don't add to an erroneous um, pulse, weight, pulse rate. All right, so which of the following sets security... This is a long one. Set security and privacy goals by extending the rules laid down by the pre-existing HIPAA law to more and different kinds of business businesses and by adding tougher reporting and enforcement provisions. I know it's a lot. <laughs> I know it's a lot, but it is a test question. So, yeah, is it the CSA, Controlled Substances Act, the Affordable Care Act? Um, is it HIPAA or is it high tech? Okay. Let's see what we got here. See some different answers coming in. All right, let's see. Uh, so we know we could have ruled out C because it says it's 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 um, it extended the already pre-existing HIPAA law. So it can't be HIPAA because it extended the HIPAA law. But yeah, it's the High Tech Act, the um, Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act. Yeah, they extended the HIPAA laws and it um, helped to regulate um, electronic medical records like you guys know. Um, one of the rules um, with medical records is that when, when you walk away from your computer, you have to lock it. You know, that was one of the things that they put into place, right? Um, it extended HIPAA's privacy laws, right? 
um, Controlled Substances Act, um, um, kind of self-explanatory. That was the act that went into place to um, to um, enforce um, um, to enforce um, the. Um, I'm sorry, guys. I'm um, doing two things at one time. The Controlled Substances Act that was for um, controlled substances to regulate those. Affordable Care Act. We know Obama put that into place for affordable um, health care. And then HIPAA, you guys know HIPAA. Um, the, portability, the portability is one provision um, that allows patients to take their insurance with them, right? To port their insurance with them if they leave an employer. The accountability provision, right, is what holds us accountable to keep patient information private. All right, which of the following is the appropriate action when removing staples from a wound? Are you gonna gently place the jaw of the staple remover on top of the staple? Um, are you going to carefully tilt the staple remover downward until the staple lifts out? Are you going to gently place the jaw of the staple remover under the staple or are you going to dispose of the staples in a waste basket? Which of the following is correct? And one of the things I, I, I always recommend is, you know, with certain questions, using process of elimination, right? Some things you can look at and you can automatically rule it out, right? So some questions you may have to start there. You may have to start with ruling out certain answers and then working your way to the correct answers because some things you're going to be able to look at and say, you know what? I know um, without a doubt that this answer is incorrect. Like I know this is because some questions, some answers they're going to put in there just is literally going to make you laugh because it's so ridiculous. So just kind of start with, using process of elimination and then working your way to the answer. All right, all right. Okay, so it looks like um, the majority of you guys were choosing C and you are correct. Oh, she's, oh, Shantari, it may be something, hope I'm saying your name correct. It may be something on your screen. Is anybody else having issues with seeing the questions? I know you said it looks, um, um, you said you can't see it. I know at one point you said it looked blurry. Um, but yeah, so you don't wanna, um, you don't wanna place it on top and risk pushing it further. Um, you don't wanna tilt it downward, you need to tilt it upward. Um, and then, of course, D, we're not going to dispose of it in a wastebasket. So with staples, we're going to dispose of those in a sharps container. OK, so and you probably knew that because you may have been thinking maybe sharps or biohazard because you already know you 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 should absolutely know that it's not going to just go in a regular um, wastebasket in a regular trash can. Right. All right. OK, which of the following requires prior authorization, a urinalysis, endoscopy, PFT, pulmonary function test or EKG? Sure. Seeing pretty much the same answer there. Yep. Endoscopy. Yep. All of those other proceed. Uh, well, they're not even really procedures, um, really. Um, and the endoscopy, the urinalysis, PFT, EKG, those are all done in office. They're all non-invasive. Whereas with an endoscopy, you know, they have to actually um, get, administer anesthesia and they have to go in with a um, with the camera. Right. Um, that's going to that's an actual procedure and it requires prior authorization with the uh, patient insurance. And if you're somebody that's looking at this and you don't know what prior authorization is, that is when they get um, pre authorization or prior authorization from the insurance to get permission to do the procedure. You have to um, give them the diagnosis code, which tells them why you're doing it. The CPT code tells them what they're doing, right, what you're going to do. Um, and you're basically saying, hey, is this a covered procedure? Can we do this? They'll give you an authorization number. However, they're still going to say 
we're giving you this authorization number, but it's but it is not a um it is not a definite um that we will pay for this, right? We're approving it, that you can have it, but we're not necessarily saying that it's a definite that we will pay. Okay. All right, which of the following pieces of information would violate HIPAA if it was on the patient signing sheet? The patient's name, name, name of the provider the patient is seeing, the reason for the patient's visit, or the appointment time. Oh, somebody said they had a prior authorization needed for all. It could be, um, if that's the case, it could have been something with your insurance that required um, you to, generally, you don't need a prior authorization for any of those things. EKG, the PFT, those are both done in the office. Um, it doesn't have to be scheduled or anything like that. It's just done like with the PFT, if you guys don't know what that is, studying the, um, we're um, testing a patient's lung capacity. You have them blow into a tube. Um, to see how um, see how much um, that they can blow. You ha they have to get it up to a certain point. Um, and that's literally just done right in the office. But, you know, I'm not sure about that. All right. See those answers coming in. Yep. So that's a violation of HIPAA for the um, if it was on the um, patient signing sheet, the reason for the patient visit. Now, the patient's name being there. That is um, technically it is revealing patient information, but it is what we call an incidental disclosure. You do have to know what that is, an incidental disclosure. That is an example of that is the sign in sheet with the patient's name, because as patients sign in, they're able to see previous patients names. So, yeah, it is, you know, disclosing a person's name, but it's an incidental disclosure because it's really nothing. You know, it's not on purpose. Um, and this is why now most signing sheets, uh, uh, the newer signing sheets, they are sticky. So every time a patient signs in, once you call that patient, you'll pull the patient sticker off. So that way nobody gets to see the person that's signing above them. All right. Which of the following resources provides holistic care for patients? Home health care, skilled nursing facility, assistant living or patient center medical home, PCMH. Holistic care. All right. I see those answers coming in. Oh, yeah. I'm going to talk about that in a second. Yep. I'm going to say I'm going to talk about that. Yep. Um, to Nolly. I'm talking to Nolly. I hope I'm saying your name right, Nolly. Um, yes. So um, home health care. Um, that is, of course, you guys know what that is. Home health care. Usually for, for people who maybe um, are older, maybe disabled, um, skilled nursing facilities. That's 24 hour care. Assistant living is for older retired patients and then a patient center medical home. So holistic care, um, Nolly, that's just referring to the whole patient, the whole person. So that's just addressing all of the needs of the patient. And that's the patient center medical home. So primary care physician, that's patient center medical home where that that provider is addressing all of the patient needs. Now, they may um, refer patients out to different specialties, but they're taking care of the whole man. All right. Which is appropriate if a parent calls in and says her child has ingested a household cleaner? Are you going to tell the parent to call back after getting the patient's the child's vital signs? Direct the patient to manually induce vomiting, contact local po poison control center, or instruct the patient to administer syrup of Ipecac to the child?
Okay. See those answers coming in pretty much um, the same across the board. Yep. You want to contact local poison control. All right. So a, we can kind of rule out because we're not going to let her off the phone and say, Hey, call us back. Take the, you know, take your child's vital signs and call us back. We're not going to do that. Now, B and D, if you are um, instructed to do that by poison control or by a provider to have the patient do those things, then that's one thing. But the very first thing you always want to do when you guys see these questions is always going to be local poison control center because it depends on the type of poison um, that determines the type of patient that the treatment needs. OK, um, now the serpent ipecac, if anybody's not familiar with that, that's just a um, serp that um, induces vomiting. All right. Which of the following supplies should an inmate place in the sterile field for a cyst removal, dressing and or bandage, uh, syringe and needle, specimen container or splint? Which should they place in the sterile field for a cyst removal? Okay, I see a mix of answers coming in. All right, let's, let's see what this is. So this is going to be the syringe and needle in the sterile field. Keywords, everything else can be placed on a counter. Keywords, sterile field, right? Sterile field. In the sterile field, I should say. All right, which of the following should be used if you find an unidentifiable liquid on the floor? A cleanup kit? A surgical towel, um, double bagged and trash bags, a mop and bleach, or um, floor cleaning solution. You don't know what the liquid is. You just happen to stumble upon the liquid. You went into an exam room and noticed something is spilled, but you don't know what it is. Okay, let's see. So we're going to go with cleanup kit because the cleanup kit is strong enough to pretty much clean up anything. We don't know what it is. Okay, so we just want to assume that it's the worst. We're going to assume that it's biohazardous and we're going to use the cleanup kit. Okay, so if you happen to come across anything in your office, you have it. And I always say, I'm kind of going left a little bit, but when you guys get into your office, whether it's your externship office or, or your um, actual office that you're going to be working at, um, Familiarize yourself with the area where, where everything is. Cleanup kits, emergency supplies, crash cart, all of those things. That, let that be one of the, the first things you do on your first day. And I'm going to make a video about that. Somebody asked. So I will be making a video about that. But that's one of the first things you want to do on your first day is becoming familiar with what everything is. Right. All right. Why should removed sutures be placed on a gauze pad to keep them sterile, to determine the number of sutures removed? for pathology evaluation or for billing purposes. Why should you put those gauze as you, I'm sorry, the sutures on a gauze pad as you're removing them? Okay. Sand. All right. Yep. So if you said to determine the number of sutures removed, that is correct because the doctor uh, or provider, they are the ones who inserted the sutures. Right. So they made a note of how many sutures they placed. So you just have to verify that the number of sutures placed is how many you removed because you don't want to leave anything there. We don't need to keep them sterile. We getting rid of, we getting rid of them. Right. They're sterile when we place them. Um, we're not sending them off for pathology evaluation um, and billing purposes. Is, um, how many we use is not um, something that we're going to bill for. Now, in the beginning, when we placed, of course, the sutures, we, we bill for that. But as far as how many sutures were removed has nothing to do with the billing.
All right. Which of the following is an example of providing education on? Oh, I'm sorry. I don't know if you guys can see this. I just had something pop up on my screen. Um, which of the following is an example of providing education on communicable disease prevention, providing an instructional video based on a patient's treatment plan, providing an adolescent patient educational material about tobacco use, explaining how and when to perform a self breast exam, or providing the patient with information about colon care screenings? Now, this is one of those things that was added. This was not um, on the old material. So as I see things that's that's newer, I'll just kind of point those things out. But this is something that was added for the, because um, most of this other stuff we've been talking about, I've seen it on the old exam, but this one right here is one of the new things. Which one? I'll give you guys a few seconds. Yes, I'm going to do this again. Um, you can always watch the replay, but I'm going to, yes, I'm going to do this again. And you didn't much as, miss as much as you think you did because no, I was supposed to start at 5, but I ended up not really starting until 5.30. I had to start over. All right, let me let you guys answer that. Okay. You say you've seen this question before. Okay. VR said I've seen this question before. Okay. All right. So let's see. All right. So um, if you picked um, B, yes, that's the correct answer. So um, educating someone on um, tobacco use, that's an example of... Um, disease prevention, whenever you're, you know, educating somebody on risky behaviors, that's an example of educating them on disease prevention. Okay. Now, um, self -pre -bre breast exam, that's an, that's a form of coaching. So when you see these questions, they may ask you that they may say, which of the following is an example of coaching that will be the self breast exam. Um, the treatment plan is also an example of coaching. Um, what is the other one? Colon, um, cancer screening. Um, um, that's going to be an example of also coaching, health maintenance coaching, health, colon cancer screening, that's health ma maintenance coaching. Um, and then the treatment plan and the, um, self breast exam is also examples of coaching. All right. Which of the following does a patient sign acknowledging that the services may not meet Medicare's medical necessity requirements? ABN, release of information, advanced directives, or medical records release? Oh, Diana, that's a that's another uh, that's another one of those things where they throw it in there. No. The tobacco use is a risky behavior because other diseases can be passed via, um, you, you can, um, I'm sorry, you can, I say can be passed. Um, the communicable disease one is just, um, I think that they threw that honestly in there. I think that they threw that in there to, to kind of trick you. But the key thing in that is the tobacco use, because of course you can get um, lung cancer and other emphysema and another, you know, lung issues from tobacco use. But that's the key in that is that you are educating them on tobacco use. That's another an example of one of those things that they throw that in there to kind of make you think, okay, well, communicable diseases, one of the first thing you probably think of is what, maybe tuberculosis or something like that. I mean, which is very highly contagious, um, I should say, but um, the key there was the tobacco use. That's an example of um, disease prevention, educating a patient on disease prevention. So I hope that made sense. All right, ABN, advanced beneficiary notice. Yes, uh, release of information and medical records release. We know that is um, patient's authorization of releasing medical records or releasing their information. Advanced directives, that is um, the patient's um, way of already putting into place what they will want to happen if they become inca incapacitated and can't make decisions, right? That's where they um, 
appoint their power of attorney. That's where they may, you know, um, create their living will, right? There, if they have a, they may want to um, implement a DNR, do not resuscitate order, right? Okay, you're welcome, Diana. All right, which of the following actions should the assistant take when using a height bar to measure a patient's height? Now, this is one that is definitely on the O. I think I already went over this on one of my videos. Um, are you going to raise the height bar when a patient is standing on a scale? Have the patient face the weight indicators? Have them stand straight up and look to one side or lower the bar gently so that it rests on their head? Sorry, guys. Looks like I went backwards. Yep. So we're going to lower it gently on, on their head. Okay. So we're not going to raise the height bar while they're standing on the scale. You want to raise it before they step up. And then we'll have them face um, away from the weight indicators. We have their back up against the bar, right? And then um, have them stand straight up, look straight ahead, right? And we're going to gently lower it on their head so that it rests on their head. I right, what's the role of a patient navigator to maintain accurate medical record and process insurance claim, identify patient needs and barriers, and assist with coordination of care and assist patients with finding community resources, assign diagnostic codes, or assist in blood collection? Um, the last question, um, oh, the height. It was about height. Which one would you do when, when checking height? And the answer was resting it gently on the patient's head oh let me take this um i didn't realize this whole time this thing has been like this it should be like this um and just confirm with me just one more time guys you can hear me i just want to make sure i just changed something on my screen i want to make sure you can still hear Yep, that was one of the old questions. Okay, good. All right, yep. So the role of a patient navigator is to identify the patient needs and barriers, assist with coordination of care, assist patients with finding community resource. Yes, that is correct. Um, now we know the um, biller um, is gonna be um, responsible for the insurance claims, right? The coder is for the uh, diagnostic codes, right? Um, and then blood collection is going to be what the phlebotomist um, or even the um, medical assistant, right? Not the patient navigator. Which of the following should the super bill include? Authorization number, security code, return visit date, or diagnosis code? Super bill. Super bill. I'm glad you made it too, Crafty. All right, let's see. Yep, the diagnosis code. If you chose D, you are correct. The super bill. So, of course, you guys know the super bill. The other name for super bill is what? Encounter. Now, that's a question in itself because it'll say, what's another name for the super bill? It's encounter. Or what's another name for the encounter? It's super bill. Um, another, you know, the way they define encounter slash super bill, um, they may say, which of the following do we use to accurately fill out a claim form? That's one of the questions you will see. It'll say which of the following is a form with pre-printed diagnosis and CPT codes on them. That is also a definition, right? Um, everything else on there is not included on the super bill. Now, I will say this because there is a question that will say something like, which, what does the doctor use to indicate when he or she wants to see the patient again? Now, they do... Um, they do put that on the encounter form. However, 
notice the difference. This says return visit date. The provider does put on the encounter form once to see patient in two weeks or one week or one month or whatever. However, that is not the same as a return visit date. So I don't want you guys to get confused on that when you see that. Well, I thought return visit date wasn't it. No, it's not it. But if you see that question about what is the, um, um, you know, what's one of the things that the provider indicates on the encounter? They do. That is one of the things they indicate is when they want to see the patient again. That's not the date, though. The date is what the scheduler gives the patient. OK, because even though the, the, the doctor says I want to see the patient in two weeks, they might not even have a date in two weeks. For those of you that's on here, you already working. You already know how many times the provider says they want to see a patient in two weeks and then realize you don't even have an opening for another three or four weeks. You know what I mean? So I just want to point that out just in case you already saw that or, you know, for when you do see that. All right. Which of the following positions allow for examination of the back of the body? Prone, supine, fowler's or lithotomy. Oh, I just realized I spelled lithotomy wrong. I'm so sorry, guys. Let me fix that right now while you guys are answering. I'm just going to stop sharing for a minute because I don't want this to be on my video. Let me just fix this real quick. Go ahead and take a minute to answer that while I fix this. All right, present, share. Okay, and as you can see, the answer is prone. Yes, the answer is prone. So if you picked A, which I see most of you did, yes, prone. So make sure you know those positions, ladies and gentlemen. Prone, right, is um, on your stomach. Supine is on your back. Fowler's is sitting up, right, 90 degree angle. Fowler's, semi-fowler's is halfway, 45 degree angle, right? And then lithotomy is, la the patient is laid on their back with their feet up in the stirrups, right, for um, vaginal exams, for pelvic exams, right? All right, which test measures ventilation function in a normal breath? Is it pulse oximetry? CT scan of the pulmonary arteries, the high resolution computerized tomography, or spirometry is measuring ventilation function in a normal breath. Okay. All right. And a normal breath. That's going to be spirometry. So the spirometry and the PFT, I mentioned that earlier, that is what we use. We use a tube that the patient has to blow into and they have to blow it to a certain point, And that is showing us their, um, their lung function, right? They're taking a breath right into the tube and we're testing their lung function or ventilation function, right? Pulse oximetry is determining the amount of oxygen, okay, in the blood. Um, CT scans of the pulmonary arteries, they're looking for like clots and things like that. Um, the high resolution or HR CT scan, um, also, um, they're looking for like um, hardening, um, or scarring, okay, of the um, pulmonary arteries, okay. I'm sorry, of the of, well, of the lungs in general, they're looking for any scarring or thickness. All right, when documenting a patient statement, which should you use? Uh, ellipses, brackets, quotation marks, or parentheses? Ellipses, brackets, um, quotation marks on parentheses, you're documenting the patient statement.
All right. Yep. If you put quotation marks, yeah. Um, ellipses are those, you know, the three dots that we're not going to use those brackets or parentheses. But anytime you're documenting patient statements and you're writing it and that exactly how they said you want to use quotation marks. And I do that a lot because sometimes um, I know one of my students asks like, well, what do I do if a patient says this? You just write it down or put it in the notes, you know, put it in quotation marks. If they say something that's not so, you know, that's not so um, clear, like if they're not just saying I have chest pain, but they may some say something like it doesn't hurt. It just feels funny. Right. And I get stuff like that a lot working in this um, this cardiology office that I work in PRN people, they say all kinds of things. If my chest doesn't feel funny. It just feels like something is move around, moving around in it. Now, you know, I know that's probably palpitations that they're feeling. So a lot of times I'll just put what they say in quotation marks, you know, especially when they're saying something, like I said, that's not so clear and you don't know what the right, just put exactly what they said. Looks like I went back. Sorry, guys. Uh, which of the following medical terms refers to the organ that stores bile? Is it nephro, cholecysto, hepato, or cysto? Sorry, guys, I accidentally muted myself. Um, just verify you can hear me now. Sorry, I don't know how I did that. I must have pressed something. Can you guys hear me? Um, I don't know if you guys heard this part. I was saying that um, I wrote the question like this on purpose. You got to know what DX is, right? What is DX and which of the following influences um, a patient's perception of it? of their DX. <laughs> yes, welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> I've been having issues. That's why I'm trying to hurry through this because I don't want any more issues. Yep, so DX is diagnosis. I wanted to make sure you guys knew that. That's why I wrote it like this. All right, I see. Oh, I don't even see any answers. I'm sorry, I might have did that too quick. Oh, I see the answers now. Okay. Um. Yeah, so it's going to be age. So that's a personal factor. Now, um, social media, family, and peers, those are social factors, right? Um, so when you, when you see this, they may ask in another way. It may be which of the following influence, which of the following social factor. And you got to know that as well. Okay. All right. 
Um, let me see here. Can you, oh, Dear says I can't hear anything. Can you guys? Let me make sure I didn't mute again. Okay, so they said they can hear. Let me know if you can hear me now, dear. I know other people say they can hear me. Um, but let me know, dear, if you can hear me now. So, yeah, so social media. I'm sorry. Family and peers are social um, factors. Social media is, um, they consider that cues to action. So this is another one that was added later that I did not see on the old information. This is something new because um, this study session is, is for the new test. However, as you can see, a lot of the information is the same. So don't worry, guys, that's taking a test after January. A lot of the information is the same if you've been watching my old videos, but they're adding more. And this is one of the ones that was added. Okay. Um, when using the EHR system for print and patient labels, which of the following would you need to manually write on a patient specimen following vein of puncture? The name and date of birth, the lab requisition number, the patient's medical record number, or the time, um, and the assistance initials. Yep. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a label. So everything else is already going to be there. We just need to add the time and our initials, right? Okay. Which state of the communication cycle involves translating a message based on subjective perceptions of pers or personal factors, receiver decoding a message, sender creating a message or sender decoding feedback or receiver creating a feedback. Which stage of the communication cycle involves translating a message based on subjective perceptions or personal factors? I'll give you guys a minute to look at those. Okay. Ooh. All right. So communication style. So this is another one of those things you want to go look at um, on your study guide. Again, this is another one of those things that was added for the new test, right? The communication cycle. Now on the older test, they did go over like um, active listening, but I do not remember seeing anything about the communication style at all. Well, I'm not going to say at all, but at least in the practice test, I don't remember seeing anything about those, but about that. Um, but let's just talk about it a little bit. So um, let's talk about sender creating a message. So that's just the stage in which the sender is communicating their message, right? Um, so when the sender is um, decoding feedback, that is when um, the it's the feedback is being decoded for accuracy and ensuring the communication is accurate. I'm just looking at a note that I made here for each of these. Um, the um, sender decode, and one thing I will say too is that we can kind of um rule out senders because this is based on us receiving right the message, so we can kind of rule out senders on these. So, rule out your senders and it brings you down to your receivers. But let me go to the next one. So, that was um. Sender decoding the feedback that involves the feedback being decoded for accurate and to ensure the communication is accurate. And then uh, which one was that? That was a sender decoding feedback. Um, we talked about the sender creating a message and then the receiver creating feedback is based on the completed review of the perceived message. OK, so that's the communication cycle. And this, again, this is from the new um, 
the new study guide. All right. Um, which of the following is true regarding orthostatic vital signs? Okay, which is true? Is it that dizziness is, is an expected finding? Um, the position order for obtaining orthostatic vital signs is standing, sitting, then lying. Um, is it true to wait one minute after each position change before obtaining a patient's orthostatic vital signs? Or is it true that orthostatic vital signs can be obtained as soon as the patient enters the exam room? Congratulations, April. So which of the following is true of orthostatic vital signs? I see. All right. So if you put C, you are correct. You want to wait a minute after each position change. Now, B, I see a few people chose B. It's kind of tricky, but B is out of order. Now, B, it should have said lying down, then sitting, then standing. That's how they got you. They put the order. They got standing, sitting, and lying. Now, with orthostatic vital signs, you're going to check the patient lying down, right? You check the vital signs lying down, okay? And then you're going to wait a minute. You're going to check it sitting. You're going to wait another minute. Okay. And then you're going to check it standing. Okay. Um, that is orthostatic vital signs. Now, A says dizziness is an expected finding. Now, we don't want that to happen. Now, do patients experience dizziness? Yes. And why was well, some anyway? If their blood pressure drops. Okay. If their blood pressure drops, that's why sometimes people get up and they feel dizzy, it's because their blood pressure is dropping, right? So it's not an expected finding. We don't want them to be dizzy. However, they will be dizzy if their blood pressure drops. And then D, we can rule out because it says can be obtained as soon as we enter the room, as soon as the patient enters. You want to wait a few minutes, about a few minutes, three to five, at least like five minutes, right? Before you start taking orthostatic vital signs. You want, and you don't ever want to get straight to vital signs when you take your patient back anyway. Because that can cause inaccurate um, high readings in the blood pressure as well as the um, pulse rate because they, as well as respiration because they just walked in, right? Sometimes they, patients come right in and get caught right back. So you want them to be able to um, sit for a little bit. So you want to wait at least five minutes. All right, which of the following systems work together to maintain homeostasis? The endocrine and nervous systems, integumentary and skeletal cardiovascular and emphatic or respiratory and muscular to maintain um but it is five minutes not minute um i'm not sure what the, yeah for so five you want to wait five minutes before you start it when they come in the room but you it's a minute between each one i'm not sure uh i hope i'm saying your name wrong show is it showed i'm sorry Showed you, let me know what you meant about that. But it is five minutes, not minute. Yeah, so it's five minutes that you want to wait before you start checking your patient's vitals when they get in a room. And then um, when you're doing orthostatic vitals, you just want to wait a minute between each one. And yeah, I have had a lot of patients who were dizzy. Now, as a matter of fact, when you have a patient who comes in dizzy, um, it is a good practice to go ahead and do orthostatic vital signs because your doctor may order them anyway. I've, I've noticed that. Um, so when I get patients, when I do work in this, this cardiology office, I used to work there full time years ago, but I just work there PRN now. Certain doctors... I mean, I'm going to do it anyway, but certain doctors I already know, like one specific doctor, like I already know she's going to want it if the patient is dizzy because a lot of times they're dizzy. Their dizziness is coming from their blood pressure dropping. Um, yeah, one minute in between. Yeah. Yeah, I do EKGs um, April all day at that office. All right. So let's see. Let's see what you guys are putting here. Just threw me with the new add in. All 
All right. So, yes. Yeah, so we know that the um, endocrine system, if so, if you chose A, you are correct. So, of course, we know the nervous system helps with, mon with maintaining temperature, right? Um, they both work together to maintain um, the endocrine maintains our hormones, right? And tegumentary, of course, that's our um, skin, right? The biggest, our biggest organ, our biggest protector. Skeletal system is for movement, right? Cardiovascular, blood um, transport and lymphatic system, lymphatic transport, respiratory and muscular respiratory removes carbon dioxide, allows us to breathe, right? Muscular helps provide movement um, and heat production, right? So, yeah. Um, make sure you guys, if you don't know your um, functions of each of your systems, if you know this is something you like, wait a minute, that just stumped me. Make sure you know your um, your um, your your uh, functions of your systems, and then homeostasis, of course, is balance, right? A state of balance. All right, let's see. Do we have any more? I think there's a couple more questions. Which of the following is an example of disease prevention coaching? Providing instructions about effective hand washing, providing the adolescent patient education material about tobacco use, providing hands-on instruction about how to check a blood glucose, glucose level at home, providing the patient with information about colon cancer screenings. And we saw this earlier. And then this is, again, this is a part of the new, new stuff. So if you're taking your um, test prior to January, you probably won't see this, but this is part of the new information that was added. All right. So we can rule out. Uh, well, let me go to the next one first. So if you were here earlier, we already ruled out um, um, B because we said this was, um, what did we say that was? That was disease prevention, but it wasn't coaching. So this was education on disease prevention, right? This was providing education on disease prevention. Effective hand washing is coaching on disease prevention. We know that hand washing is the most effective way to prevent disease, to, to prevent spreading germs. Um, glucose level, um, hands-on instruction, that is coaching on, um, that's also a form of coaching, but it's compliance, right, to be able to, for the patient to be able to, you know, um, check their glucose levels at home. And then colon cancer screening, we said that is a part of coaching, health maintenance coaching, okay? Colon cancer screening, that's health maintenance coaching, okay? So um, I think this is the last one. Oh, no. Which of the following veins should be used as a last resort? Cephalic, basilic, medial, or supplemental cephalic? Oh, it's in December, Jacqueline. Okay. Oh, do I teach or lecture EKG? Oh, no, April, just a little bit. Um, we have an EKG class, but I don't teach that class. So um, we get a little bit into it. There's a um, the intro to EKG. So yeah, I do. I have a couple of videos on the channel um, on EKG. So you can search that April. You can just look on my channel. And this it was very recent. It's like in the last couple of weeks. So you should be able to see it there. All right. Cephalic, basilic, medial, or supplemental cephalic, which is the last resort. Okay. I was glad nobody put medial because that's the first one we want to go want to look for. So yeah, it's going to be the basilic. That's the last resort. Um, cephalic and it's commonly used supplemental cephalic. Those are the other, um, little veins, uh, surrounding the cephalic vein, but the basilic, we could use it. It's just, we want to go for that one. If we don't have anything, if we don't have a medial vein, um, or a, um, cephalic vein to go into. So ladies and gentlemen, 
I hope that this was helpful. Make sure if this video was helpful to you, make sure you like it. If you're not subscribed to my channel, make sure you subscribe. I'm doing more videos. Um, I will be doing, I'm going to start back doing these live um, sessions once a week. Now that the new information is out, people kept asking, when are you going to do more videos? The reason why I wasn't doing any was because it takes a long time to create these slides. And I didn't want to create slides and I knew the new information was coming out. Right. So I just got info. I just got access to the new information. So now that I have that, now I can start back doing lives again with the new information. But like I said, a lot of the information is really the same. Um, it's just added. So like that communication cycle was one. The coaching was another thing that was added. Um, as I do more, I'm pretty sure it's probably going to be some COVID guidelines added. I haven't gone through it all yet. Um, but, um, it's just added information. Um, if you haven't already, make sure you join my Facebook group, the medical assistant lounge. I have some MA t-shirts as well. So that link is below the video, got t-shirts and stuff like that. So check those out. And they'll always, you know, you can always email me if you have any questions, you could schedule one-on-one -on -one. that link is below. So I'll take a few minutes to see if you guys have any questions before I log out. I hope that this was helpful. I know somebody said they're taking their test tomorrow. Somebody's taking theirs on Friday. My students are taking theirs on Friday. So my students that's watching this, I hope y'all been studying and I hope your life has been revolving around this test. That was one of the tips that I gave at the beginning. Your life should be revolving around this test up until you take your, you should be waking up, going to sleep with this information on your mind. Let me know if you guys have any questions. Oh, thank you, Patricia. I'm glad to help. Um, just want to see. Yes, it's going to help with the, with the, yeah, with the 2023 exam as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. it's a lot of the same information. It's just that some of it won't be on the new test. Like I, I never saw the communication cycle. I never saw those coaching questions. So that stuff is probably not going to be on there, but, um, most of it is, most of it is the same. The, the material that I have reviewed so far, it seems like it's the same. One thing, too, I want to tell you guys, make sure you all are taking advantage of the skills builder. If you if your school has paid for skills builder for you, if you're taking the NHA, you have the study guide, you have the practices and you have skills builder. Those will really help with your um, procedure questions. So like that, that question about the staple, removing the staples, if that wasn't something you learned in class, you'll learn it on a skills builder because you might've seen that and was probably like, I don't know how to remove staples. I don't know what to do. And in, and in that case, you know, you look at your, um, your procedure videos, you know what to do, right. Assisting with the, um, the cyst removal, that question, things like that. That's what the skills builder is for. Let's see. Um, I just want to see if anybody, um, So the study guide we just went over, do you think will be on it? Oh, yeah, I just answered that question. Yeah, she take her test um, Friday. So Erica, like I said, some of that stuff won't. The coaching questions, I didn't see that. But for the most part, yeah. And also, Erica, I hope you've been watching my older videos. So there's eight videos all together. All of that stuff is definitely going to be on your test because that is those are older videos. And so the test, all of that information still applies to the test that's being administered until December 31st, because January 2024 is when the new test will go live. I was watching a medical terms video and couldn't find one. Yeah, the prefixes, I don't think I did any prefix on that one. I was actually just thinking about it. Um, that's one of the videos I'm going to do. I'm going to do some, Um, I think I mentioned that a video, I was going to do a part two. So that's what I'm going to be doing in the next one. Um, Serena is the prefixes. Yeah, it's just a root and a suffix. Yep, I'm going to add the prefixes. Okay, so Crafty says I take my test in January. Yeah, so January is when a new test go live. So you definitely want to be tuning into the, the new materials. And like I said, guys, the old stuff will help too, but it's just, it's added, added stuff. No, the study guide is not free. If your school pays for it, it's free, but um, you do have to pay for it. And this is what I always say. If you can only buy one, because I know everybody can't buy the study guide and practice test. I always say, if you can only buy 
either the study guide or the practice test. If you can only buy one of the two, just get the practice test. Because I think the practice test, both are important, but I think the practice test do a better job of preparing you. Because as you can see, as we were going through those, you know, the wrong answers, they're going to show you the wrong, that they're going to give you the, the answers to the wrong answers as we'll explain those. And that's going to give you a better, um, just kind of, just kind of better prepare you for the actual test. All righty, let's see. Just looking for any more questions. Okay, you say, okay, got you. All right, guys, I'm just going to go through this one more time. I just want to make sure I'm not missing anything. Um, congratulations on everybody that passed. I know April said she passed. There was somebody else that said they passed. Congratulations, everybody. Oh, when am I going live again? Good question, Kendra. My name twin. Um, I'm going to go live again next week. So I'm going to, my plan is to go live every week going forward. Now I can't tell you exactly which day because it kind of varies depending on what I have going on today. Wednesday work better for me. So usually it could be a Tuesday, Wednesday or Thursday. I don't see myself doing it on a Friday. I may even do a Saturday morning one, one week, but, um, just look out. If you have your notifications turned on every time I schedule it, you'll be notified and then you'll be notified when I go live. So yeah, the goal is once a week, at least once a week. If I can go more, I will, but the goal is at least once a week. So hopefully next week I'll be live again. All right. Oh, I'm glad to, I'm glad it was helpful, Kendra. Okay, Daisy, you taking yours in December. Okay. All righty, ladies and gentlemen, you all have a good night. If you happen to have any other questions, feel free to put them in the regular comment section. I'm going to go ahead and log out of here. And um, I think I'm going to have to go pick my daughter up. So I'm going to go ahead and get off. Do you have a P.O. box? Um, you know what's so crazy, April? I had a P.O. box that I was paying for and I wasn't using. So I literally just canceled it. <laughs> um, I've been I've had it for years and I've just been paying for it. Um, but I'm thinking about getting another one because I need a, um, I'm thinking about getting a virtual address anyway for, um, for my business. So I'll let you know, but thank you for thinking of me. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you guys have a good night and be safe. Oh, for those of you that's about to take your test, study, study, study. Like I said, let your life revolve around this stuff. Okay. All righty. Y'all take care.